Hello, plant people. How are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley. I like to take science and apply it to all things plants. In today's video, we're talking about how to grow giant root vegetables. So I took the weight of these guys and this one's almost a pound. This one's over a pound. It's actually bigger than my biggest potato, which I, I'll do a separate video on how to grow giant potatoes because it's a little bit different method that I use. But yeah, anyways, and this is not an anomaly. I've got quite a few of these. I didn't, my carrots are still in the ground. The only carrot I ripped out was this one because I have to bring it to Nate's on Monday because we're having a grower or shower competition and let's just say I think I'm gonna own Nate when it comes to products growing. He has a watering issue. He refuses to water and that's why his plants fail. But it's not a temporary thing. It's actually I grow these. This is not an anomaly. I did have to rip them out though because I have so many. I have a whole year's worth of beets in this bucket and so much damage from voles. So while I grew huge ones, I mean, is it was it worth it? I don't know. So don't mind the kitchen. I am processing a ton of food right now for the winter stores. And you guys want to know how I grew my giant veggies. So let's get into it. So this is going to be very specific to cold climate gardeners and also just root vegetables. My giant tomatoes I grew, um, my giant spaghetti squash, potatoes, it's all a little bit different how I manage it. So first things first is variety. You need to get the right variety for your climate. So I will leave the link down below for these two root vegetable varieties. I don't grow parsnips. I don't grow turnips. I don't really grow radishes either. That's because I don't like the taste of them. So this is kind of Keats carrots and beets is all I do uh, for root vegetables. Reasons for that is I make beet relish, borscht, and then I just can beets and you can just do them kind of like potatoes on a frying pan, or you can make actually very good salad dressings from beets. And then carrots, I like to ferment, pickle. I also like to roast. They store very well outside of a canner. Beets, not so much, but um, just like, I'll show you how to store these. I'll show you how to store these on my second channel, which is more like the homestead prepper, whatever you want to call it. Just how to keep your food alive to eat when it's not in the ground type video. So I'll do a video on how to actually uh, store these carrots properly, but these guys I'm going to can. Um, I can show you. I'll do a video on the different ways I can these as well. So key here is variety. You need a variety that's going to do well. So the beets that I grow are a winter's variety. I think it's like winter's keeper or something like that. And they are able to take cooler soils, cooler nights, cooler days, and ultimately cooler evenings. So, or, or late falls. And because of that, I can put them in May long, before May long, when the soil is actually pretty cold still. They will germinate and then they will take light frost if there is any after they germinate and into fall if the voles didn't get to them i could have left them in even longer and i would have expected these to be even larger because it's really nice and warm outside very nice and sunny and it's going to probably continue to do that for another two weeks and you'd be shocked how quick these can get now bigger veg does kind of get a different taste to it so the more this woodiness kind of spreads down it will it'll alter the taste so you know, in some cases, if this is for fresh eats, you'd want to maybe harvest them a little bit sooner. So variety here is key. The variety that I linked down below will work great for anyone in like a colder climate. If you're not in a cold climate, I don't know what variety you should use. I can't really recommend that because I've never tried that. So I would never tell you to get something that I don't know if it works or not. But I would assume you'd want more of a bolt resistant variety or you could plant these cooler crop versions or cooler seed versions in the spring or in your fall to go to spring as like a winter crop type thing um because you are you guys are able to continuous crop where you are so variety is number one the second thing is thinning so if you guys watch my video on my secrets to thinning I do do my thinning a little bit different. So I seed pretty thick for beets and carrots. And then for my thinning, I actually physically go in and pick the carrots as they're going throughout the entire season. So by the end of the season, they're fully thinned probably, and beginning of August, they're fully thinned. 
but from June and July, I am literally just eating baby carrots and baby beets because A, they taste good and thinning I find to be pretty wasteful. So it's a great way to still get these big, huge carrots or beets without just decimating, you know, 50% of your crop because depending on how heavily you seed them, it may or may not be worse or um, it, it may or may not be 50 or, or more percent that you actually end up having to remove. But when you get to eat it, I mean, benefits, right? Now, the other thing you could do is get pelletized carrot seeds in particular. So pelletized seeds are a clay-based seed. They look like they're funky colors and they're treated. They're not. It's literally just clay with seeds inside um, rolled up into balls. So the reason for that is because you can visually just see how the, the seeds are spaced out. So then you don't have to thin as much if that's, if that's an option for you. But Thinning is key. Now, besides thinning is reducing competition in general. You want to make sure that the competition is like next to none. This means for the first month, you need to weed like a crazy person between the rows, between the plants, zero competition except for the carrots or the beets, whatever the root vegetable is. Now, when we seed these, we're going to make a mound and this is very important and this may or may not anger some people but you need to till now before i before you cut my head off tillage is when we are manipulating the ground at all at all if you're manipulating the ground you are tilling the only true no-till practice would be broadcasting seed and i don't know many gardeners that actually do that so you can do a low till method which i've showed you guys how to do which is simply a broad fork or a pitch fork in the ground and you're going to lift the soil or you can roto till it or double dig it with a shovel but you need it fluffy very fluffy do not walk on that when it is wet do not walk on it in the area that you are seeding and if you do walk use like a two by four or some way to walk across the soil that will evenly distribute your weight so you're not stomping down in specific areas that is so important and if you have to go in the garden to weed or to do anything it's the two by four and it's bone freaking dry. Do not walk on wet soil whatsoever. And this goes for the lawn people. This goes for the perennial people. The If you're doing flowers, do not walk on your garden when it's wet. Weed before you wet the soil. Harvest before you wet the soil. Plant before you wet the soil. Do not walk on wet soil. It is. It literally will just crush your pore space even natural pore space that is developed in a no-till scenario with like roots and just natural aggregation of the soil you step on it you're going to squash your pore space and it's game over for you know even getting close to something like this so i like to make a mound and i'll just do a row mound and i'm going to seed into said mound and then when i weed i'm going to weed into the rows i'm going to pull it up into that mound and i'm almost going to mound similar to what we do with potatoes the actual little seedlings themselves what this is going to do is it's going to make sure that we're not completely relying on the soil structure to ensure that the carrot or the beet gets big and we're going to allow that carrot or that beet to grow inside of kind of a floof mound and the mound doesn't have to be big it only has to be about a foot or two wide but ultimately that's going to help your root vegetables enormously so this is very important and that is nutrients now i don't add nutrients much anyways to any of my gardens I kind of just let them do their stuff naturally when I add compost or manures I add very little I do not add much maybe an inch if you want to look at composting and the way to compost properly or to add compost properly if I was to take this beet and the leaves and I was to dry it down grind it up and compost it, how much of this do you think is going to be left? Like weight wise, amount wise, if you have a dehydrator or a freeze dryer, you guys know how quickly what looks to be like a lot of produce basically becomes nothing. I literally just did a whole bunch of cauliflower scraps in the dehydrator because first of all, scrappy cooking is like the best way to make different types of like sauces or to make different types of um, powders anyways so i did cauliflower stems um leaves and then kale 
stems as well. It's just literally scraps that I was using in my broth that I then, um, anyways. So I dehydrate them. Think of that. It's not going to be much, and that's how much you need to re-add. If you're adding inches or inch or two inches every single year or twice a year, you're over fertilizing your garden by a lot. The soil is pretty darn good at doing its own thing. So I do not over fertilize. If you are using a lot of compost or a lot of manure or a lot of synthetic fertilizer in your garden, you are probably hundred, I can almost guarantee you because of the number of soil samples that you guys have actually sent me the nitrogen levels in those tests are like through the roof. I can tell when you're adding too much compost or when you're doing a no dig straight compost setup. I know when you're doing it because it's so obvious from your soil test. So I, you have too much nitrogen, you get more disease, more pests because you have this nice luscious green growth it's very easy to infect and it will reduce your root volume because that plant is going to be like there's a ton of free nitrogen here let's put it all in the leaves it's not going to put much into the roots roots are best grown with phosphorus or potassium and not as much nitrogen now if we're using less fertilizer or um we're going organic as possible with no or little, very little synthetic, and I have nothing against synthetics. I really don't care what you do. I use synthetics. So if you, these ones are grown organically though. So if you do grow them in a setup with nothing added, you want to make sure you water. Water, 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 water. The only way this plant is going to be able to get this size is with water for a few reasons. There's a lot of water content just in this beet on its own. Secondly, the actual nutrients can't get into the, these root hairs or this root system without water. That's literally the mechanism for the nutrients to get into the plant to grow something of this size. So you need to water. Now, you need a good draining soil and that's why we keep it nice and loose the entire year. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. If you have a soil that pools or you're seeing pooling, you may need to consider watering twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, 15 minutes at a time, or you can do once every two days, very thoroughly, once every three days, very, very thoroughly. We want a continuous supply of water in that soil that is not pooling. It's just moisture. It's, that's what we need there. Which brings me into my last and final tip, and I do think this is a game changer for the potatoes, the beets, and the carrots, is taking a pitchfork to that mound and doing a little lift. So what I like to do is I take the pitchfork, I will put it around the plant, nowhere near the plant's roots, literally surrounding the ground around it. I'll stick it in and I'll give it light little tugs around the, if it's a mound, in a circle, if not in a row. And I won't go between the rows, but I will just go down the row, both sides, nice tiny little lifts. And again, this is just going to help to fix any compaction that may have happened because you were in a rush and you did run across the garden or you have animals, which is my issue. I have animals that compact it or you have heavy rains or just a heavier soil in general that's just not very well aggregated and it's kind of homogenous in nature. You can give it that tiny little lift and it's going to make a big, big difference. It's going to increase microbe activity. It's going to increase aeration and ultimately just the floof of it will allow for these roots to do their job. Now roots by all means on plants can break through cement. I mean, roots are very, very tough, tough plants. So I wouldn't chalk up the loose soil as the big benefit here. I think it's a combination of all the, the choices that I've made to actually perfect this, but ultimately that is what you want to do. So if you wanna grow giant veg, seed selection, soil prep, soil maintenance throughout the entire year in the form of not fertilizing with too much nitrogen, not walking on it while it's wet and giving it a little floof mid-year, and then ultimately making sure that the darn voles don't get at your beets because 
that's gonna be a nightmare to process now. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Anyways, I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button and let me know in the comments down below. If you've ever grown giant veg, send me your photos on Instagram. I'd be very excited to see that. And be sure to share this video because sharing is caring. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.